series. If we add the terms of an infinite sequence, we get an expression like this, which is called an infinite series, or just a series for short. And it is denoted by the symbol sigma, n equals 1 to infinity of a n. And this symbolizes trying to add up infinitely many numbers. So first we must ask the question, when does it make sense to do this? For example, if we looked at the sum n equals 1 to infinity of n, this would simply be 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 indefinitely. And this would very clearly add up to infinity as we are just adding larger and larger numbers. So does it ever make sense to add up infinitely many numbers? Well, indeed it does. Let's consider the following example. If we look at the sum n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over 2 to the n power, we get 1 over 2 plus 1 over 4 plus 1 over 8 plus 1 over 16. And if we add this up indefinitely, we can show that the sum of this series is equal to 1. And I can show you this is true using two methods. One is very rudimentary. Suppose we have a square that is one unit by one unit. And so we know the total area of this square is 1 times 1, which is equal to 1. Now, the terms that we're adding here are going to be a portion of the area of that square. So 1 half would be 1 half of the area of the square. Let me shade that in. And then I'm going to add to it the number 1 fourth. Now, 1 fourth will be 1 fourth of the area of the original square, which would be this area here. And then let's add 1 eighth. 1 eighth would just be half of the remaining area. And then 1 sixteenth would be half of that area that remains. And you can see that if we continue to do this, if we continue to add half of the area that remains indefinitely, you can see eventually we are going to fill up the entire square here. And so if we add up all of these areas, it is evident that the total area will be equal to 1. Now let's show an algebraic way of getting this sum. Consider partial sums. So the partial sum S1 would just be the sum of the first term, which would just be the first term, 1 half. S2 would be the sum of the first two terms, which is 1 half plus 1 fourth, which is equal to 3 fourths. The sum of the first three terms is 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth. And if you add these up, you can show that it's equal to 7 over 8. The sum of the first four terms is 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth plus 1 sixteenth. And again, if we get a common denominator and add all these together, we will see that we get 15 over 16. So can you guess what the fifth partial sum would be? Well, you should be able to see a pattern developing here. The denominator of the first partial sum is 2. The denominator of the next partial sum is 4. And then the next one is 8. And the next one is 16. And so it would seem reasonable that the next denominator, when you add up the first five terms, would be 32. And then what is the numerator? Well, if you notice, the numerator is always exactly one less than the denominator. And so we would expect to get 31 over 32. And this is indeed the case. 
And since this continues, the next partial sum will be 63 over 64. And the one after that will be 127 over 128. And so what we can do in the end is we can find a formula for when we add up the first n terms of this series. So the relationship here is the denominator is always the power of 2 that is equal to the partial sum that we're talking about. So for example, in the third partial sum, 8 is 2 to the third. In the fifth partial sum, 32 is 2 to the fifth. So in the nth partial sum, we would expect to get 2 to the n power. And then on top, we would have 2 to the n minus 1. Or we could express this as 2 to the n divided by 2 to the n minus 1 divided by 2 to the n. And in that case, would simplify to 1 minus 1 over 2 to the n power. But what is the sum of the series n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over 2 to the n? Well, it should make sense that it would be equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of this nth partial sum. Because again, the nth partial sum is just when you add up the first n terms. And when we let n go to infinity, it means essentially we are adding up all infinitely many of those terms. But this is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the formula for Sn, which is 1 minus 1 over 2 to the n. And this very clearly is 1 because this goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. And so we can see the sum of the series is equal to 1. Now this is going to lead us to a very important definition about finding the sum of a series. Given a series sum n equals 1 to infinity of a n, let s n denote its nth partial sum. That is, its nth partial sum is the sum from i equals 1 to n of a i, which again is just adding up the first n terms. If the sequence of these partial sums is convergent, and the limit as n goes to infinity of s n is equal to s, then we say the sum of a n is convergent. And we write the sum of that series is equal to s. So in other words, the sum n equals 1 to infinity of a n is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth partial sum, provided that this limit exists. In this case, we say the sum of the series exists and the sum is convergent or the series is convergent. If this does not exist, then we say the series is divergent. So as a basic example of this, suppose we know that the sum of the first n terms of some series is equal to Sn, which is 2n over 3n plus 5. So if we know this is the sum of the first n terms, then the sum of the series is going to be the limit as n goes to infinity of this nth partial sum. And we can show by using basic limit techniques that this limit would be 2 thirds, and therefore the sum of the series is also 2 thirds. So if we have a formula for the nth partial sum, it is very easy to get the sum of the series. The problem is we don't normally know a formula for the sum of the first n terms. In the next example, we wish to show that the series sum n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n times n plus 1 is convergent, and we also want to find its sum. And this is a special type of series. I want you to notice, first of all, that if you simply plug in values of n into this, you are going to get 1 over 1 times 2 plus 1 over 2 times 3 plus 1 over 3 times 4 plus 1 over 4 times 5 
etc. And in doing this, we won't be able to find the sum of the series because we won't be able to get a formula for the nth partial sum. So even though we know that the nth term is 1 over n times n plus 1, we don't know what the sum of those first n terms actually is. So for this, we have a special technique. What we're going to do is take the expression 1 over n times n plus 1, and we're going to break it down using a partial fraction decomposition, which we discussed in an earlier video lesson. And so if we look to determine the values of a and b here, remember that you can multiply both sides by the least common denominator, and this will lead to the equation 1 equals a times n plus 1 plus b times n. And then if we let n equal 0, we will find that a is equal to 1. And if we let n equal negative 1, we will find that b is negative 1. And if you want, you can pause the video here and verify that this is true. But this means that the expression 1 over n times n plus 1 is equal to 1 over n minus 1 over n plus 1. And that, in turn, means that the sum of the original series can be rewritten as the sum of the term 1 over n minus 1 over n plus 1. Now let's observe what happens here when you plug in values for n. So when n equals 1, you get 1 minus 1 half. When n equals 2, you get 1, excuse me, you get 1 half minus 1 third. When n equals 3, we get 1 third minus 1 fourth, etc. So what you might notice here is that when you add these terms together, you get some cancellation here. And so we could look to find the sum of the first n terms, which would just be this. And indeed, these will cancel out. These will cancel out. The negative 1 fourth will cancel with the term that comes after it. And that's all the way up to the end where the 1 over n here would have canceled with the term that came before it. And so we can see that the sum of the first n terms is 1 minus 1 over n plus 1. And now we have a formula for the nth partial sum. So then the sum of the series is the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 minus 1 over n plus 1. And this is very clearly equal to 1, since 1 over n plus 1 goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. Now, this type of series has a special name. It's called a telescoping sum. And the reason we call it this is because these terms cancel out, and the series collapses like an old telescope. Now, this technique is interesting and fascinating, but you won't be able to do this for most series. The most important series is the geometric series. The geometric series is a series formed by taking a number a, not equal to 0, and then adding to it that same number a multiplied by some number r, known as the common ratio, and then adding r times that term to get the next term. So each time we are multiplying the previous term by r, and that becomes the next term. And so a is often called the first term of the geometric series, and r is the common ratio. And when you write it in summation notation, we have the sum n equals 1 to infinity of a times r to the n minus 1. And the reason it's n minus 1 is because when you plug in n equals 1, you should get r to the 0, which means there is no r in the first term. To find the sum of such a series, we would look to find the nth partial sum. The nth partial sum is the sum of the first n terms. 
as we've been talking about. And so for this particular series, the sum of the first n terms is what you see here. Now, to determine what this is equal to, we're going to employ a little bit of a trick. What if I multiply the left side of this equation by n? That is going to, excuse me, by r. That is going to give me r times s to the n. And that will be equal to r times the right-hand side of the equation. But what do you get when you multiply every single term on the right side by r? Well, a becomes a times r, and I'm going to write that here. a times r, when you multiply it by r, becomes a r squared. a r squared, when you multiply by r, becomes a r to the third. And if we continue doing this, we will have a r to the n minus 1 here, but that's not the last term. When you multiply this by r, you will get a r to the n. Now what I'm going to do here is subtract these expressions from each other. So we're taking the left-hand side minus the left-hand side and the right-hand side minus the right-hand side. And so on the left side we have Sn minus R times Sn. And on the right-hand side we have A minus AR to the N. Notice what happens when you distribute the negative to each one of these. All of these terms here are going to cancel out. And so we simply end up with a minus ar to the n. Now on the left side, we can factor out sn. And when we do that, we get 1 minus r. And on the right-hand side, we can factor out a. And we get 1 minus r to the n. And so Sn is a times 1 minus r to the n divided by 1 minus r. And this is actually the sum of a finite geometric series. So in other words, if I have the sum i equals 1 to n of a r to the i minus 1, this would be equal to this particular sum. Now, we aren't here to talk about the sum of a finite geometric series, but it is worth mentioning that this is the formula for that sum. We want to talk about the sum of the infinite geometric series. And so we're looking at the sum n equals 1 to infinity, a r to the n minus 1. And we know that this is going to be the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth partial sum, by definition, and this is the limit as n goes to infinity of a times 1 minus r to the n divided by 1 minus r. And we know that this limit will be equal to a over 1 minus r if r is a number in between 1 and negative 1. Now to understand this, we're basically just focusing in on this part. We know that this limit goes to 0 if r is a number in between 1 and negative 1. We talked about that in the previous video lesson. So what we have here is the sum of an infinite geometric series. This is equal to a divided by 1 minus r if r is a number in between 1 and negative 1. Now, if r is not a number in between 1 and negative 1, then the geometric series here diverges. So we have this summarized nicely here. The sum of an infinite geometric series is equal to a divided by 1 minus r. If the absolute value of r is less than 1, please keep in mind that this just means r is in between 1 and negative 1. And if r is not a number in between 1 and negative 1, then this geometric series is divergent. So in our first example, they ask us to find the sum of the geometric series. To find the sum, you need to know two things. You need the first term a, which is very obvious here. It's equal to 5. 
and then we need to know what is the common ratio. Now, to get the common ratio for a geometric series, all you need to do is take any term and divide it by the term that came before it. So, for example, in this problem, the second term is negative 10 thirds. I'm just going to divide that by the first term, which is 5. And this is negative 10 thirds times 1 fifth. And if you do the math here, you get negative 2 thirds. Now, I will show you that it works no matter which two terms you choose to divide. So if I pick the third term and the fourth term, the common ratio is going to be the fourth term divided by the third term. And in this case, we will have negative 40 over 27 times 9 over 20. And 9 goes into 27 three times, and 20 goes into 40 two times, and you can see that you have negative two-thirds there. And so r is negative two-thirds. And this is good because negative two-thirds is a number in between one and negative one. And this means that the sum exists. And we know that that sum is equal to a divided by one minus r, which in this case is five divided by one minus negative two-thirds. And this is 5 divided by 5 thirds, and this is equal to 3. In our next example, same question, is the series convergent or divergent? Now, first of all, we have to recognize that we have a geometric series. And I, I have to admit, this does not come across as a geometric series. Remember, a geometric series has the form summation n equals 1 to infinity a r to the n minus 1. But what we can do is take this term here and apply some algebra. So let's rewrite this. First of all, 2 to the 2n is the same as 2 to the second power to the n. And 3 to the 1 minus n is the same as 3 to the 1 divided by 3 to the n. And this is because of powers or properties of exponents, excuse me. So we know that when we have exponential expressions with the same base, we subtract those exponents. So 2 to the 2 to the n is the same as 4 to the n times, and then 3 over 3 to the n, I can write this like this. And then I could put the 4 and the 3 in the same set of parentheses, since they both have an n power here. And then I could say times 3. Now, if you really want to get technical here, I'll put the 3 in front. I'll take one of those 4 thirds, and I'll pull it out. And then when I do that, I will have one less 4 thirds inside the parentheses here. So basically, I just took one of these factors out. And this is equal to 4 times 4 thirds to the n minus 1. So my point here is just to show you that we can indeed put it into this form. So let's summarize here. This series here can be rewritten as the sum n equals 1 to infinity of 4 times 4 thirds to the n minus 1. So for this geometric series, a is 4, and r is 4 thirds. Well, 4 thirds is bigger than 1. And if r is a number bigger than or equal to 1, the series is divergent. So there is no sum of this series. Even though it is geometric, the value of r is bigger than 1, and therefore it has no sum. Next, we have another example of a geometric series. Once again, we just want to find out if this has a sum or not. So the first term is 3. The common ratio, let me pick a couple of successive terms. Let me take 16 thirds and divide that by negative 4. And this would be 16 thirds times negative 1 fourth. And this is negative 4 thirds. And negative 4 thirds is less than negative 1. 
So there is no sum. Remember, to have a sum, your value of r needs to be in between 1 and negative 1. Negative 4 thirds is over here. So there is no sum of this geometric series. The next example is yet another example of geometric series. So I hope you're starting to see that geometric series are extremely important. We want to write this number, 2.3171717, as a ratio of integers. So first of all, let's remember what this means. 2.317 bar means that the 17 repeats forever. So what is this equal to? Well, we could take the whole number 2 plus, and then let's just look at the first decimal. 0.3 is the same as 3 tenths. And then the next part is 0 0.017, right? Because the 7 is in the thousands place. So you can think of this as 0 0.017. That's going to be 17 over 1,000. Plus, and then the next 0.17 is going to be 17 over 100,000. Again, that's because the 7 here is in the 100 thousandths place. And what you'll notice is that from this point onward, you are getting a geometric series. So 2 plus 3 tenths, this is just 20 over 10 plus 3 over 10. But then here you have a geometric series where your first term is 17 over 1,000. Your next term is 17 over 1,000 multiplied by 1 over 100. Your next term is going to be 17 over 1,000 multiplied by 1 over 100 quantity squared, etc. And so this part of the sum is just 23 over 10. This part of the sum is the sum of a geometric series. And we do know that r equals 1 over 100, which is less than 1. So it is going to have a sum. For that geometric series, 17 over 1,000 is the first term. And we're going to divide that by 1 minus the common ratio r, which is 1 over 100. And then now we just need to do the math here. And so we have 23 over 10 plus 17 over 1,000 divided by 99 over 100. And this is 23 over 10 plus 17 over 1,000 times 100 over 99. 100 goes into 1,000 10 times. And we end up with 23 over 10 plus 17 over 990. And indeed, we can combine these together by getting a common denominator. All we have to do is multiply the first fraction by 99 over 99. And this is going to give us 2,294 divided by 990. And we can reduce this fraction to get 1,147 over 495. And indeed, if you divide these numbers on a calculator, you will see that you get this decimal. So any repeating decimal can always be written as a ratio of two integers. And this is how you do it. You use a geometric series. Next, let's find the sum of the series, summation n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n, where the absolute value of x is less than 1. So we have the sum n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n. If n is equal to 0, we have 1. If n equals 1, we have x. If n equals 2, we have x squared. And then x cubed, x to the fourth, etc. So this is a geometric series with the first term equal to 1. And the common ratio is x. And since the common ratio is x, and since we know the absolute value of x is less than 1, 
then that means we know the sum exists and the sum is given by the formula a over 1 minus r, which in this case is 1 divided by 1 minus x. So this is really interesting because it says that the sum of this series is equal to 1 over 1 minus x. And if you add up the terms of that series, what you basically have here is an infinite degree polynomial. And this infinite degree polynomial is equal to 1 divided by 1 minus x if x is a number in between 1 and negative 1. And we'll talk a lot more about this kind of phenomenon later when we talk about power series. Next example, show that the harmonic series is divergent. The harmonic series is an extremely important series, and it is the sum of 1 over n as n goes from 1 to infinity. And it gives us the following sum. 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third plus 1 fourth, etc. Now when you first look at this series, it appears that it probably should converge, but it does not converge. So let's prove why it does not converge. The first partial sum is simply 1. And I'm going to write this as 2 divided by 2. You'll see why in a minute. The second partial sum is 1 plus 1 half, which is 3 divided by 2. Now I'm going to skip the third partial sum, and I'm going to go straight to the fourth partial sum, which is 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third plus 1 fourth. And this is going to be bigger than 1 plus 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 fourth. And the reason this is true is because 1 third is bigger than 1 fourth here. Everything else is the same. But if you add all these up, you get 2, which is 4 divided by 2. So the fourth partial sum is bigger than 4 divided by 2. Next, let's look at the eighth partial sum. The eighth partial sum is 1 plus a half plus a third plus a fourth plus 1 fifth, 1 sixth, 1 seventh, and 1 eighth. And this is bigger than 1 plus a half plus a fourth plus a fourth plus 1 eighth, 1 eighth, 1 eighth, and 1 eighth. Now why is that? Well, 1 fifth, 1 sixth, and 1 seventh are all bigger than 1 eighth, and 1 third is bigger than 1 fourth. The rest of the numbers are the same, but these numbers here are larger than these numbers here. So we know that this sum will definitely be bigger than this sum. But if you add these up, a fourth and a fourth is a half. 1 eighth plus 1 eighth plus 1 eighth plus 1 eighth is also a half. So we have a half plus a half, plus a half, plus 1, and that is 5 over 2. Now, what I'm going to show is that the 16th partial sum, whatever it is, is going to be bigger than 6 over 2. Okay, so you're starting to get the pattern here. So the 4th partial sum was bigger than 4 over 2. The 8th partial sum is bigger than 5 over 2. The 16th partial sum is bigger than 6 over 2. And this pattern continues. The 32nd partial sum, whatever it is, will be bigger than 7 over 2. So the partial sum of the 2 to the nth term is always going to be bigger than n plus 2 divided by 2. Okay, so to understand this, you need to understand that 32 is 2 to the 5th power. 16 is 2 to the 4th power. So the number on the top is always 2 bigger than the power of 2 here. So what is the limit as n goes to infinity of s sub 2 to the n? Well, it is bigger than the limit as n goes to infinity of n plus 2 divided by 2. But this limit is infinity. So if this limit is infinity, and this limit is larger than this one, then this limit is infinity as well. 
And that means the sum of the series is infinity, and therefore it diverges. So what you need to know from this is the harmonic series is a classic example of a diverging series. Next, we have a theorem about convergent series. This theorem says if a series is convergent, then the limit of the nth term must be equal to zero. Let's look at the proof. We can define the nth term of a series to be the nth partial sum minus the n minus one partial sum. Think about that for a minute. If you add up the first n terms of a series and you subtract the first n minus one terms of the series, you're gonna be left with just the nth term. And we know that the limit as n goes to infinity of this nth term will be equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of Sn minus Sn minus one. But this can be separated into the limit as n goes to infinity of Sn minus the limit as n goes to infinity of Sn minus one. But since we know by the hypothesis that the series is convergent, then we know the limit of the nth partial sum is the sum of the series, which we can call S. But the limit as n goes to infinity of Sn minus one is the same as the limit as n goes to infinity of Sn. So it is also equal to S and s minus s is equal to zero. So we know that the limit of the nth term must be zero if the series converges. Now the much more important consequence of this theorem is called the test for divergence. And it is when you take the contrapositive of this statement. So we're going to say, if the limit of the nth term is not zero, then the series cannot be convergent. And that's what this says down here. If the limit of a n does not exist, or if the limit of a n is not zero, then the series must be divergent. And this is called the test for divergence, or sometimes we just call it the divergence test. Now this is a test that you will not be able to apply very often, but when you can, it is extremely valuable. Consider this example. Show that this series diverges. Well, let's take the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth term, which is n squared over five n squared plus four. This limit is equal to infinity divided by infinity. But if we apply L'Hopital's rule, we can take the limit as n goes to infinity of 2n divided by 10n. And this limit is 1 fifth because these n's cancel out. And 1 fifth is not zero. And since the limit of the nth term is not zero, this implies the series must be divergent. So the divergence test is extremely easy to use when it works. Lastly, when you have converging series, sum of an, sum of bn, then you have the following properties of summations. So the sum of a constant times an is the constant times the sum. So you can factor a constant out of a summation like we have been doing now for some time. The sum of a n plus b n is the sum of a n plus the sum of b n. And the sum of a n minus b n is the sum of a n minus the sum of b n. So all of these are very intuitive properties, but this is only true when these are converging series. So let's find the sum of the following series. Notice I have the sum of this term plus this term. Let's consider those terms separately. So first, let's look at the sum of 3 over n times n plus 1. I can use a partial fraction decomposition here to rewrite this as a over n plus b over n plus 1. 
And then multiplying by the least common denominator on both sides, we get this. And if I let n equal 0, we will find that a is equal to 3. And if I let n equal negative 1, we get b equals negative 3. And so this series becomes the sum n equals 1 to infinity of 3 over n minus 3 over n plus 1. And if you look at the nth partial sum there, you're going to have 3 minus 3 over 2 plus 3 over 2 minus 3 over 3 plus 3 over 3 minus 3 over 4 plus all the way up to the nth term, which is 3 over n minus 3 over n plus 1. And what you should notice is that you have a telescoping sum here. These terms all cancel out. And your nth partial sum simplifies to 3 minus 3 over n plus 1. And the limit as n goes to infinity of this nth partial sum is clearly 3 since this goes to 0. So we know that the sum of this series is equal to 3. Now let's look at the sum of the second one. So here we have the sum n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over 2 to the n. This is the series 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth plus etc. This is a geometric series with the first term being 1 half and the common ratio also being 1 half. And we know the sum of this series is a over 1 minus r, which is 1 half divided by 1 minus 1 half, which is equal to 1. So the sum of this other series here is equal to 1. So what is the sum of our original series? Well, again, this one added up to 3, and this one adds up to 1. So the sum of our original series here is just going to be 3 plus 1, which is equal to 4. And that concludes this video lesson.